hopefully um, other members of the group will uh, catch this um, on the video. So yeah, okay, so uh, welcome everyone and we will pick up where we left off last week. So we talked about identification of the common eight species um, and tonight we will look at how we turn our observations into useful biological data. Um, this, this isn't the most exciting presentation, <laughs> not so many nice pictures of bumblebees this time, but uh, bear with me, I'll, I'll make it as, as short and sweet as I can. Um, so first of all, we'll start off with the fact that um, bumblebees as a group within the UK and globally actually have been in de decline um, for decades and uh, in the UK, it was the 1980 Atlas of Bumblebees that really was able to uh, just demonstrate that decline based on records going back to 1900. And they found that over a third of our social bumblebees, if you remember, we have 18 species, have declined by more than 70% uh, in that 80 years. So that's, you know, a quite a dramatic uh, decline. Uh, two species have gone extinct and whales very much part of that uh, nationwide and global picture and we currently have five species which are listed of conservation concern which are on our section seven list and that's the shrill cardaby, the brown banded cardaby, the moss cardaby, the red shank cardaby and the rude roll bumblebee. Um, we have varying numbers uh, of records of those five species in Wales. The Rudral and the Red Shanked in particular, we have hardly any recent records at all. Um, the Shrill is potentially on the verge of extinction in the UK. And we have three of the five UK populations of the Shrill card be in Wales. They're very, very isolated. We don't know how it's doing within those populations and is currently the focus of a conservation strategy by the Trust. Um, the brown banded cardaby is doing relatively well um, and the moss cardaby um, is ex probably less so. So, um, you know, the picture is slightly gloomy, although I was just saying to Meg before you all joined that I feel everywhere I go at the moment, people are, managing grasslands and creating meadows and restoring meadows and thinking about what they can do in the wider landscape for bumblebees um, and other pollinators so you know it isn't all doom and gloom so in Wales but the reason for my project of which this is part is that we don't really know how our bumblebee species are doing either the common or the uh, more scarce species. So that's, uh, you know, the reason for being for, for Skills for Bees Wales and why we're trying to encourage people like yourselves to record what they see. So in order, I, I should say as well, um, sorry, um, I should say those declines that we've seen, you, you'll hear talk of lots of different things, you know, habitat, loss and insecticides and pesticides and, and climate change and everything. I mean, it's generally recognised that habitat loss has had the biggest single impact on bumblebee species in the last uh, century. Um, the other things less so. It's loss of forage of species rich landscapes and it's it's due to changes in agriculture basically those losses are, are pretty much due to changes in land management and then the other things then compound the problem so what can we do we need more rigorous uh, rigorous standardized data as i've just said so that we have better baselines of where we are now and this requires more volunteers and you know, it's my job to train people in identification, but also recording. 
And we need well-designed scientific schemes uh, to help us fill this gap. You know, gone are the days where you had a small numbers of sort of well-off gentlemen recording their wildlife, you know, um, uh, in times gone by. We need armies of keen citizen science scientists to, to collect um, much more data, really. But those schemes need to be well designed. So Bee Walk, um, particularly, uh, has been designed to, to fill that gap for bumblebees. OK, so what I'm going to go over this evening is two ways of becoming a recorder. Now, some of you might already be experienced recorders, so please forgive me if I'm going over things that you already know. Um, and these two are not mutually exclusive. You know, you can do both and I do both. So firstly, becoming a recorder, you can submit individual sightings of bumblebees just when you're out and about, you know, walking the dog, having a walk with kids, grandkids, whatever it is. If you see a bumblebee and you can identify its species, you can submit your sighting into iRecord, which is the British National recording online recording system or into your local environmental record center either way the record will end up in the same system and for you your local environmental record center is subrec okay which i'll go on to in a sec the other way you can record which is more of a commitment but it collects even stronger data is by setting up a bee walk monitoring transect on a piece of land on your own as a group you know I, I don't know whether you can do it as a volunteer group with the project you're involved with etc so um i'm going to talk about both of those ways of submitting oh there's my falda now of submitting records okay so firstly the first way which i'm going to refer to as ad hoc recording just submitting individual records like i said you can do it into i record so do look that up or if you're already using it just continue with that but the other way is into the local environmental record centers and we have four in wales we have Cofnod in the north west wales biodiversity information center at down my neck of the woods in the southwest this um, who I've been working with the last week up in Powys, which covers Powys, and Seabrack there, which is South East Wales. Okay, so those are our record centres. I've been working with them really closely and they're all fantastic. And by submitting into the local record centres, you know, your data goes straight into a local database. And I've each one has four different ways of submitting your records. And I've, I've downloaded Cofnods, a screen grab from Cofnods website here to show the four different ways of recording into the local centres, but all of them offer the same systems on their own websites. So you can submit by online recording via the website so for you it would be subrec you go into their website and you can register as a recorder and submit records individually there which is very straightforward i personally use the lurk wales app which i find just brilliant really intuitive and enjoyable to use and it means that i just do it when i'm in the field so boom i see something the records in and it will work if you're offline, if you've got no signal, it'll just store the record and it'll just send it off as soon as you come into signal. So you can use that anywhere. You could submit your records to your county recorders. I don't think there's a bumblebee recorder in Subrec, but it's worth having a little check. Or false, you can do it the old fashioned way and send them an email or even a bit of paper. <laughs> Although I should think there's very few recorders that do that now. 
and they've got a downloadable recording spreadsheet that you can either download and send in as a piece of paper or you can uh, just send it back with your records. So the LERCs are really easy to use and super helpful. You can even give them a ring and uh, they will help you to submit your records. The Lurk Rails app, um, here is what you will see on the App Store or Google Play, this lovely little logo with the four Lurks um, images on. Um, there is a really good um, video on how to use it on YouTube on this link. Um, Meg, could you make a note for us to send that out to everyone after when you send the video out, yeah, please? No Thank you. Um, and basically for every record, just like when you submit in every record, any, any record through any of the pathways, you need what you saw, um, who saw it, when they saw it and where they saw it. So you need those four bits of information, who, what, when, where. So before you submit a record, ideally you want to try and get your ID as confident as you can. So that might mean using, um, for example, what's that Bumblebee app, the books and field guides that um, I've, sh I've shown you. Did I show you books last week? I've done so many courses this week. If not, I'll show you a slide with all the uh, field guides on and um, the Bee Wars Facebook page, etc. So you need to be thinking about your ID before you send off your record. But there is a great team of verifiers on the end of all the Bee records. And if you can get a photograph to send in with your record into the app or the other systems, then the verifiers will either say yay yeah or nay. So you don't have to worry too much if you're not 100% confident. OK, but try and get some photos if you can. So that's the app and we will send those details for the YouTube video. So that's ad hoc recording in a very quick nutshell. I hope that's OK. What I'm going to do now is introduce Bee Walk, which is run by the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. And its aim is to gather both abundance, so data on numbers and distribution data for our UK bumblebees. Because with ad hoc records, like if you see a bumblebee, so say Terry saw a red tailed male bumblebee today in his garden and he sends that record in, we know that that species was recorded in that place on that day. So it's occurred there. What we don't know is how well it's doing in that place. So we have no information there on numbers. We don't know from year to year whether it's occurring. We don't know if it was just a stray male that's been blown out of its usual spot. So what Bee Walk does is it gives us abundance data and that's what we've never ever had in the past. So it's quite a critical difference in terms of what we can do and what we can infer from that information. And second point there, the second bullet point, that data allows us to analyze and report trends in bumblebee populations over time. And critically, we can begin to monitor how they are changing with time due to factors such as climate change. So, for example, our bee walkers this summer, we will be able to analyse our bee walk data this summer, for example, in relation to this heat wave. How does it compare to the last 10 years data, for example? OK. And it critically, it can give us early warning signs of decline of a particular species. In so the method, very basically, we ask volunteers to walk a transect, a, transect, a fixed route 
once a month between March and October. So it's not quite as onerous as the butterfly monitoring scheme because it's only once a month, not once a week. We ask that the walk is between one and two kilometers, kilometers long. And bumblebees, every bumblebee that you, pretty much you see is identified to species and counted along each section of your transect, which I'll come to in a minute. And data is submitted to the Bumblebee Conservation Trust via a dedicated website. So you don't submit it in the same way that you submit ad hoc records into the late record centres, you submit it directly to us. And then we share it later once it's been analysed. So just a little bit more detail on that. So first of all, you need to establish a transect. And we suggest that volunteers establish a route which is safe and accessible to you. I made the mistake of establishing my first bee walks miles away and then it became a real chore to do it. So try not to do that unless you're very committed. And you want your bee walk to take in different types of habitat, but that needn't be like triple SI, you know, incredibly amazing stuff. It could be a local park, it could be gardens, it could be village, it could be a nature reserve, um, it could be farmland. Um, but as long as it's interesting for you and that it's safe and accessible, and that hopefully you're going to see some bees at least. Okay, so as I've already said, one to two kilometres long, that 60 minutes walk is only a guide and when you start out you'll take longer because you'll need to keep stopping to identify the bees so um, don't expect necessarily to do it within an hour and within your transect you should have three distinct sections based on habitat so you could have for example um, I don't know say you start in a village churchyard which is managed as a meadow so you could have a sort of churchyard meadow and then along a country lane with hedgerows and then through the park and back to your house something like that so you, you've got some distinct differences along the way and try and map your route before you uh, brave the website the bee walk website so that you, you know your sections and you can visualise your route because you've got to draw it onto the website. OK, now this is our dedicated Bee Walk website. So if you're going to set up a transect, this is where you'll need to go. And we will have a look at the website live in a minute um, so that you can get a bit of a feel for it. So this is the home page. And when you go to um, www.bewalk.org, um, this is where you will land. And um, are you all right there, Terry? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'll I'm not muted. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe, yeah, that was quite a loud you all. <laughs> I'll mute myself. <laughs> no, don't worry. It's so hot. I'm so hot. And I can't, I can't open my window because I'm on a main road. So you wouldn't hear me over the traffic. So I'm going to start yawning in a minute for sure. But um, yeah, this is this is the home page of Bee Walk. Um, and registration is a two-step process, which is a real pain. I'm not going to pretend to you that Bee Walk is the easiest thing to set up because it's not. But once you set your Bee Walk up on the website, um, it's done. You don't then have to do it again. You know, once it's there, it's there. So step one is to register on this link, this word here. You click on that to register with the trust as a bee walker. So you will be on our list. You will be covered by all our bee walk guidelines. You'll have access to information and all of those things. You will be a registered volunteer. So um oh what I'm gonna do now, because this is my 
yeah, I'm going to go back. Sorry. So we're going to do step one. And I am going to um, take you to the actual website. So bear with me. I'm going to have to open my window, I think, because I'm so hot. The road's quite quiet now in, at this time, but if it gets distracting, let me know. So, so this is the website and I am actually um, logged in, but when you go to register, you will be met with a BeWalk registration step one, Google form. And this is just the trust, you're only registering with the trust. So these details are held very safely and legally, et cetera. And you submit that, and then you will be faced with horror of horrors, an ID test. That is not to filter you out. That is for us to just get an idea of where you're at. So when you do the ID test, make sure you have all your books, your guides, whatever you've got. Don't rush it. And it's multiple choice. So it's not too bad at all. And if you only get half of them right, that's fine. But it just knows that maybe, you know, you might need more support or whatever. So, so don't worry about it. So that's the registration step one. And what we'll have a look at before we move on to step two. Oh, I should say as well, once you've done that, you'll get an email off my colleague, Sally, the Bee Walk officer to say you've registered, okay? Now, I always like having a little play with this map. So this is our Bee Walks um, hotspot map, and it shows us where we've got the most Bee Walk records. Can you see that okay? Yeah, brilliant. So I'm going to zoom into Wales. And you can see that South Wales, I've done, I live in Pembrokeshire and I've done most work with the trust in Pembrokeshire. So that's a real hot spot. But also around Cardiff is as well. You can see mid to North Wales has hardly any bee walks at all. So I've got my work cut out for the next two years in those areas. But if we zoom in on your area, is this group, Meg, based around Cardiff? Yes. Yeah. So where would you like me to zoom in? Anywhere in particular? Uh, I don't think anywhere in particular because the idea is that people will uh, get allocated sites um, from Sam, the local nature partnership coordinator, uh, where we're surveying the grasslands. Okay, does uh, yeah. Well, you can. Uh, does that give you guys that are on the call an idea if there's a bee walk in your patch? Do do feel free to unmute if you want to. Um, you know, chip in. Claire, can you can you maybe zoom in around Tromorfa Park? Where's that, Mfalda? So uh, let's see if if you start to zoom in. So it's kind of um, is it west west of the city center? West of the city yeah, center. So, so it's near it's near the water. So you now we can just kind of a bit down more, here. A bit more. Can you go a bit more to the left? To your left. No, 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 oh, sorry, the other <laughs> This is very difficult. <laughs> Terrible. Uh, a bit more, a bit more? Yeah, I think there's no, yeah, there's no, no walks in there. So. Okay. Yeah, when you see like Adams down, like that area, Pengam Green. Uh, so the park, you can see the park just there, where it, where it reads Pengam Green. That's the Morpha Park. So it's quite, yeah, you don't have anything in there. Okay, so that's kind of good. So it's good yeah. for me. Cool. Okay, so anyway, you know, I suppose what I'm saying is there's scope for lots more B walks <laughs> and lots more recording. 
Um, and I'm sure there's loads of good habitat as well. So, so yeah. So anyway, I'm I, I love this map and I, I'm getting a bit distracted with it actually. So let's move on. Claire, Claire um, can yeah? I ask you another question? Yeah. Does that count like if, uh, uh, pe people's gardens or it's just like, you know, you, you have to have like a transit or would you count as well in the gardens, for instance? So it, if, if you did a transect, it could definitely take in the gardens as long as it's a continuous walk. But if you are just recording in your garden, then I would use the ad hoc ways of recording. Okay. So, okay. so submitting into the app or into iRecord. Okay. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. Okay, so um, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go back to the presentation. Okay, so the second bit, so that was um, the first bit, and that brings up the Google form. The second bit is to register with the actual BWALK website and create a BWALK account. So this is where it gets a bit fiddly. So what you're gonna do is set up an account on the BWALK website. So you need to log in again and create a new password for the BWALK website, and you'll get an email to activate your account. Okay, from Sally, this will all make sense when you do it. And the first thing you do, um, when you get into the BWALK website, so you've registered, you've activated your account and you're now live on the site in your own little area. The first thing you do is insert the details for your new BWALK. And that's quite straightforward. And I will go to the website in a minute. This is just a screen grab. But on the first page, you just put in a name for your transact. You click on a start point on the map and it will give you the grid reference. And then you put in the county, the number of sections, which you should have an idea about by that point, because you should have been out and kind of ground truthed it. Overall lengths will come at the end because your mapping section will give you the lengths and the year established, you know, whatever it is, 2021 or 2022. And then step two, you actually draw your route onto the um, site, onto this interactive map. And I strongly, strongly recommend you read this yellow box in detail. This bit is fiddly, okay? Um, but I will go to the live bit of the web website and give you a, a quick demo. Um, but that's drawing on your whole route onto your map. And then you can see these tabs you go to, sorry, I'll move on from that. You would go then to section details and enter the details for each section. So I'm gonna show you that live now. I'm sorry, this is always a bit of a bitty presentation. So if we go to, so this is my, my BWALK account and I've got lots of different sites because I do um, you know lots of, of sort of demos online so just to exemplify what I showed you on the slides the first tab when you when you start your transit you put in your details so the name and then you can click I'm just going to zoom out there so this is down in Penali, near Tembi, near where I live. And there's the start of my transect there on the edge of the dunes. And that gives me the transect, which identifies my first square. And then the county is Pembrokeshire. The number of sections I do is four. And I haven't put the other details in. I'll put 2021 in. And save. And then you go onto your route then to draw your 
route onto the um, onto the map. What I do want to do, this is where I, it it isn't it isn't a brilliant site. I have to say, it can be very frustrating. I'm just looking for. Can anyone see where I can do the layers? I wanted to put it onto satellite. Oh dear. Is it the little blue cross on the side? Where? Oh, is it? Yeah. Is it that? Oh yeah. Thanks, Meg. That's better. So my site, so this is the car park at Penali. And basically you select your section to draw. So section one is highlighted in like a dark blacky green as opposed to blue. And then this is where it always goes wrong for me on here. So I'm gonna click on draw route now, insert section. Oh, horrid. This is where the, the site does get quite um, Oh, let's try section two. So when you're drawing your lines, you click on the line tool there. I'm not going to dwell on this because I don't want to confuse you and get it all wrong. It's best to read the instructions. And then you draw each section. So you click, then drag, and then click again. You can move the map by holding down the mouse. So I'm going into the dunes now. And every time I want to change direction, I just click. So this is all section. Whoops. Uh, horror. That's right. Just so. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> So we'll we'll take it to there. And then when you finish the section, you double click. Hopefully that should work. Okay. All right, it's calling that yes, yeah, section two now. So basically it's a case of click, drag, click every time you want to change direction. And then when you finish the section, you double click. Okay. And then there are tools to erase that erase the entire route or to remove a section. So I'm not gonna dwell on that because it's too hot and I don't wanna confuse you, but um, we do have a lot of support for this, for this bit of setting up your transect, which I'll, I'll point you to um, in a bit. And then the last tab is for each of your sections on your transect. So on this one at Penali, I've got four sections we need you to record a habitat. So for example, I've got section two highlighted at the moment. And there are a whole list of habitats. And for that one, it, it would be coastal dune grassland, okay? If there is a second habitat present, I don't know, it could be dry scrub and shrub thickets on a dune, something like that. You could put that in as well. And any, any text description for your habitat. Um, and we also ask you to put in the primary land use. Now, there's a really weird selection of land uses. So please just choose best fit um, for a dune land use. Wow, I'm not sure it, it, there's a whole, if you see something that fits unused land, I'll put, okay. So choose the best fit for that. Those are taken from some sort of scale. And what it gives you at the end as well is your section length. So it, but when you've done them all, you can work out the length of your route. All right, so that is um, setting up your transect. 
it isn't fun as you've just seen but like I said once you've done it once that's it you don't have to do it again so let's move on to walk in your walk which is the fun bit and also on the Be Walk website we have um, a whole resources section across the top of that home page. And on there, there's a big thick thing of guidelines and there's also some downloadable sheets. Now, I have to be absolutely honest with you. I, I feel we need this to be drastically updated, probably with an app so that you can submit your data in the field. But at the moment we have these monthly recording sheets which you can download and print off. And basically, every time you do your bee walk, you record this environmental data here in the top box. So record a name. That's particularly important if there's a few of you doing um, a bee walk. The date of each particular walk, obviously. Start and finish time. The name of the site. So that's just the name of your walk temperature at the moment it feels about 30 degrees in here um wind speed according to the scale and the, sun, the um conditions sunny cloudiness etc all of that data is inputted into our systems and is part of the analysis and then when you record in your species you're going to do it section by section and this is another thing I think section should be at the beginning. So if, for example, you see a red tail male in section one, as you're walking along, you would put red tailed in there, or Bombus lapidarius, section one, and then the cast, if you know it, if you're able to do it. Like Delina was saying, it's not always easy and it's not always possible. But if you can put the cast, queen, worker or male, that's good stuff. And then you do a tally chart. So you don't have to write that species and that for that cast down again. If you are a good botanist, we're really, really happy to receive data on um, what flowers they were foraging on. But don't worry about that. It's not necessary. And then you carry on recording your species for section one. And then as soon as you hit section two, you'll write a new line for each thing that, that you see, each species that you see and so on until the end of the walk. Okay, and then the last fiddly bit is your data entry. So for this, um, you you go on to um, your walks on the on the home page. There's a tab for your walks. You go on to your walks and you're presented with a calendar and you click on the date for the date you did your walk and then you add this data. So the name of the walk again, um, the date it was done, basically all the things from the top of the sheet, the kind of basic data. That's the calendar that you see. Okay. And I'll just go very quickly, bear with me. So I'm gonna go back, whiz back to the web website and show you that page. So you go into my walks at the top here, third one in. Right, filter, because I've got so many walks on the go, we'll go National Botanic Gardens. This is one that I used to do quite a while ago. So you can see you're presented with the current year and to submit data, you would click on one of the green circles for the appropriate date. But if I go back, I haven't done it for a while. It was taken over by somebody else. Oh, there we are. So I'll click on the 5th of April. And there you have the details for that particular walk on that particular day. 
And then you can see all I saw on the 5th of April was um, two queens, one in section one and one in section six, because <laughs> it was so early in the year. Okay. So that's what the, the data section looks like. It's under my walks and the resources section there you are on the website, you've got full guidance document, which is a really weighty tome, um, quick, a quick start guide, etc. health and safety. And there is your monthly recording form there about seven or eight thing down for you to download. There's a photography guide that, that is really good, actually, it's really comprehensive. Okie dokes, we're nearly there, folks. Thank you for bearing with me. So we've done that, so we'll move on. So, um, so I don't think I said this last week. So for ad hoc recording, so if you're just submitting individual records, as I said at the beginning, you don't really need all this stuff. You can just do it, you know, and just to have a camera or a good phone camera. And that's fine. You'll be able to identify quite a lot of things by doing that. But really, if you want to do a bee walk, you need a little bit of equipment. So a field bag is a really good idea, like that goes across your body instead of a rucksack, because you can have your hand lens, your little field guide, uh, your phone, your camera, your, your pots, um, all in there, all to hand. So that's quite useful. Um, a net, a basic net like this is absolutely fine for bumblebees. These are the beginner butterfly nets on Watkins and Doncaster, and they're about £12 each. And I, I think they're great because they're quite sturdy, but they're lightweight. They're perfectly adequate. Hand lens, times 10 is absolutely fine for bumblebees. You don't need anything more. So cheap and cheerful is the best. Um, I use sample tubes, so I get specimen tubes from Watkins and Doncaster, and I just use kitchen roll to gently immobilize the bees, um, not harm them in any way, but just immobilize them so I can use the hand lens through the tube. Some people use these queen marker cages, but I, I don't like them at all, but I've just put them in there because some people get on with them. I, I prefer the kitchen roll method. So that's your basic field kit. And then I mentioned earlier on some guides. So Bumblebees, which is published by the Trust, is a really, really good beginner guide just for bumblebees. Uh, really well written, really clear, and really easy to access the information. Um, and the ID guide itself is good. It's only a tenner as well, so it's cheap. This guide by Edwards and Jenna is a really nice one to have in your field bag because it's really small and neat. And I've always carried that in my field bag as a little prompt, although it's, um, you know, it's quite slim line compared to, to this one. This one you might see on Amazon, etc. This is an excellent book, but it's quite heavy going. And the ID section is very much a heavily technical scientific key. So I wouldn't recommend that for beginners. It's better when you're looking at the rare stuff. This one down on the left, this is actually written by my manager, Richard, and this is a lovely kind of bumblebee coffee table book, but not brilliant for ID, but it is a really, really nice book and you can get it for about Fiverr online. So I'd recommend that. And then there's Stephen Fawkes, Bees of Great Britain and Ireland, which is absolutely brilliant. But again, it's quite a highly technical key and it includes all the solitary bees as well. So it's a really thick book um, and not for the faint hearted, really. I would say if you're a bumblebee beginner, go for the one on the top left for now and maybe the one on the top right, actually. OK. For identification. So before you get to submitting records, there's all those books 
but there's also Bumblebee Conservation Trust website, got a whole section on ID. There's our app, which is great for the um, common species, the common eight, really good actually. I, it's free, so I definitely download that if you've got uh, a phone or tablet. And if you're on Facebook, the UK's Bees, Wasps and Ants group is absolutely brilliant for help with ID and it's monitored by experts. So incorrect IDs don't get through and you can use all of those to help you with ID before you actually submit your records, if you see what I mean. Oh, yeah, Stephen Fort Flickr pages, absolutely brilliant. I think I might have demonstrated these last week. Did I demonstrate them? Um, I can't remember, but um, those are what I showed you just now, Terry, for those two male bees. They were on Stephen Fork's Flickr pages. So do Google that, it's completely free. And um, there's loads of pictures of every single species. So it's great for comparing and identifying before you submit your records. And optional homework, so no one's gonna check up on you um, could be registering for an online recording system or downloading the app or have a think about maybe setting up a bee walk. Um, right, I've got a quiz there, but I what I wanted to do as well, I'm just going to open another presentation because... I wanted to show you one more slide about um, so things to remember on Bee Walk, but I wanted to show you the support available. So these are the Bee Walks across Wales on this little map, but maybe um, Maybe Meg, we could send this slide to people yeah, because be we've got, there's some information on Bee Walk on our website. There's also um, the guidance video link there, the website, but also my colleague Sally is a dedicated Bee Walk officer. So if you have any problems at all, you can email Sally and she's brilliant and she'll help you with setting up your Bee Walk. We also have quite a lot of um, abandoned transects that we'd love to give to people that are already set up. So you don't even have to do all that horrible, ghastly mm. stuff on the website. Um, so that's another thing to ask, Sally, is, you know, this is where I live. Is there an abandoned transect near me? Um, and yeah, that's it, really. The, the only thing I've got is... Um, I have got some slides here on the sort of data we can pull out of bee walks. So for example, this is Bomba sylvarum, the very threatened shrill carder bee. And we can, we can track how it's doing in any particular year and then compare it to previous seasons. We can try and work out how management is affecting things in particular areas. You know, there's all sorts of things we can do um and we can we do that with a common species as well um and though these these statistics are of 2019 we had almost 2000 registered users on our site but we only have you know a quarter of those actually submitting data so it's really good if we can get some more people actually established and confident with what they're doing Right, I'm going to stop there because it's hot. And just, um, are, there, are there any questions on B1? 